glamour, luxury, beauty. When you think of the company Chanel, you most likely think of a high-end luxury brand known for its tuffeted bags or iconic double C logo. And although Chanel is now a powerhouse in the fashion industry and an icon in its own right, did you know that this company has an extremely controversial past and you may not even be aware of it? Hey there, and welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Blair or the Illuminati. And if this is not your first time here, hey, I'm Blair or the Illuminati. And today we are going to be uncovering the disturbing truth behind one of the world's biggest brands, Chanel, and its controversial founder, Coco Chanel. But before we dig deeper into Coco Chanel's relations with the Nazi party, let's take an overview of Chanel, the company. And yes, I did just say that you did not mishear me the Nazi party. But let's rewind a couple things before we jump down into this rabbit hole. Chanel SA is a French privately held company and was founded in 1909. The headquarters is in this area in France, which I'm not gonna bother to pronounce, and also in London. With over 300 locations around the globe and an $11 billion annual revenue, the company is one of the top leaders in the fashion industry. The business is currently owned by Alain Worthmere and Gerard Worthmere. Alain and Gerard are grandsons of Perry Worthmere, an early business partner of Coco Chanel. The company specializes in upscale fashion with a wide variety of haute couture, ready to wear clothing, luxury goods, and accessories. Its iconic products in which the world knows them for are the little black dress, perfume number no. five de Chanel, and the Chanel suit. Coco's designs were unique compared to other 19th century attire. Common clothes were built for functionality rather than style. Coco Chanel broke boundaries with this and was the godmother of luxury fashion. Nowadays, people will sell an arm and a leg just for a designer Chanel handbag, but what if they knew the truth about this company? So let's explore the life behind the mastermind behind the trademark. And I apologize in advance, I don't speak French and I didn't grow up learning how to speak French, so I'm going to butcher a lot of words here, so please don't get too angry with me. Gabrielle Chanel was born on August 19th, 1883. Her mother, Eugenie Duvol, was a laundry woman in a charity hospital ran by the Sister of Providence, a poor house in France. Gabrielle's father, Albert Chanel, worked as a street peddler, selling work clothes and undergarments. Albert and Eugenie did not marry until 1886, three years after Coco's birth. And Eugenie's family persuaded her to marry Albert, who believed in having a unified front effectively to pay Albert. Coco had two brothers and three sisters. She and her siblings lived in a crowded one room lodging in this town in France that I'm not gonna even try to pronounce. When Coco was 12, her mother died of what was believed to be tuberculosis at only 32 years of age. The diagnosis is now reflected on as inaccurate. She is now thought to have died from causes of poverty, pregnancy, and pneumonia, which I'm not 100% certain how that makes anything more accurate. After her mom's death, Coco and her sisters were sent to a convent in Albazine, a religious organization that took care of abandoned and orphaned girls. Coco's two brothers were sent to be farm laborers. At the convent, Coco lived a frugal, demanding, and strict life. This is where she learned how to sew, a skill that would later become more than handy in her life. Once 18, Coco went to a boarding house for Catholic girls in Moulins, France. Adapting her learned sewing skills, Coco became a seamstress. Additionally, she had a stage career and made her debut singing at a cafe concert, an entertainment venue of the era. She sang in a cabaret and was a posez, which was a type of performer who entertains between stars turns. Often she would sing her favorite song, Who Has Seen Coco? She loved the song so much that she adapted her own nickname to Coco. No longer Gabrielle, Coco's performance lured many military men to her. While living in Moulins, Chanel met a very young, charming French ex-cavalry officer, Etienne Balsan. At age 23, Chanel became Balsan's mistress. 
For three years, Chanel stayed with him, most likely because he was a very rich man. This self-indulging lifestyle in which Coco adapted to with him is what many believe to have inspired Coco to lead her later luxurious lifestyle. Coco had fancy dresses, diamonds, pearls, whatever she wanted, she had. In 1908, Coco had a devilish affair with one of Balsan's friends, Captain Arthur Edward Capel. Chanel had stated in reminiscence of this time when two gentlemen were outbidding for my hot little body. Yeah, narcissistic much? Capel was a wealthy man of the English upper class and gave Chanel an apartment in Paris. The man even financed her first shops. In 1913, Chanel opened a boutique paid by Capel in Deauville. In her store, she introduced casual clothing with luxury elements. But wanting to climb higher, she opened another store in Barritz in 1915. The store in Barritz was so successful due to its location near a casino that she had enough money to reimburse Capel. Speaking of her previously mentioned love affair, Capel and Coco's affair lasted a total of nine years, despite Capel marrying an aristocrat, Lady Diana, during their affair in 1918. As for Arthur Capel, he died in a car accident on December 21st, 1919, ending the long-lived affair. Despite this tragedy, Coco continued to rise up in the fashion industry. In the same year of Capel's death, she registered as a courtier and founded Maison de Couture at 31 Rue Cambon, Paris. Shortly after, Coco met yet another wealthy aristocrat, the Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich of Russia, and they had a relationship for about a year. She continued to expand her name, and by 1927, Chanel had five properties on the Rue Cambon buildings and many other locations surrounding upper-class areas. It was during this period in her life that she associated with wealthy British, Parisians, Soviets, and elites, and this is how she gained bias approval from other leaders. In 1923, Vera Bate Lombardi, the daughter of the Marquess of Cambridge, allowed Chanel entry into the highest level of the British aristocracy. This group had associations surrounding notable politicians such as Winston Churchill. In this clique, Chanel met the extremely wealthy Duke of Westminster. The Duke being an outspoken anti-Semite lavished Coco with royal luxuries. So naturally, the two had an affair lasting about 10 years. During their relationship, the Duke increased Chanel's hatred towards Jews and supported homophobia. Coco Chanel, as quoted by her friend Paul Moran, stated, "'Homosexuals? I have seen young women ruined by these awful queers. Drugs, divorce, scandal. They will use any means to destroy a competitor and to wreak vengeance on a woman. The queers want to be women, but they are lousy women. They are charming. Not only homophobic, but Chanel is also a hypocrite. Wikipedia states that by 1935, Chanel herself had become a habitual drug user, injecting herself with morphine on a daily basis, a habit she maintained to the end of her life. Another one of her many relations also linked to this mindset with another man named Paul Iribe. Coco had an affair with him and stayed in touch for many, many years. Chanel and Iribe both believed profoundly in anti-Semitism. Chanel went out of her way to finance Iribe's monthly nationalist newsletter called Le Temoin. This newspaper, or shall I say propaganda, spread the ideas of fearing foreigners and encouraged anti-Semitism. It was around this time that Coco began designing for films, gaining even more popularity with celebrities now wearing her brand. By 1935, she had established a massive enterprise, having over 4,000 employees. Her rapid growth continued throughout the 1930s. At the start of World War II in 1939, Chanel closed her shops, only keeping her apartment house at 31 Rue de Cambon. With her hate towards the Jewish and her association with society's elites, they had grounded certain views within her. She firmly believed that Jews were a threat to Europe 
Europe due to the Bolshevik government led by the Soviet Union. During the German occupation, Coco stayed at Hotel Ritz, a hotel preferred by upper-class German military. It was there that she once again engaged in yet another relationship with Baron Hans Guther von Dinklage, a German diplomat. During the terrible war, Coco Chanel took advantage of Jews losing their property. The two Jewish directors of Parfums Chanel, the Wertheimers, fought for Parfums Chanel, a perfume company. The Wertheimers were clever towards Chanel's attack and handed the company over to their Christian friend, Felix Amel. Chanel never did gain control of the company during this time. After the war was over, Felix returned Parfums Chanel to the Wertheimers. Coco Chanel became fully committed to the German cause in 1941, working for the chief of German intelligence agency, otherwise known as the Secret Service. She also worked for the military intelligence spy network. The French Prefecture de Police held a document on Chanel in which Chanel was described as a courtier and perfumer, a pseudonym Westminster, agent reference F7124, signaled as suspect in the file. People began to get suspicious towards Coco. Her involvement seemed to start when German tanks entered Paris and began Nazi occupation. Chanel sought refuge at Hotel Ritz, AKA the headquarters of the German military at that time. During this period, many French women were punished for collaboration with German officers, but Chanel was not punished despite her close relations with the Nazis. Her most notable collaboration with German forces was Operation Model Hut. Her role in this operation was to be a messenger from Hitler's foreign intelligence to Winston Churchill. The goal of this mission was to prove that part of the Third Reich attempted peace with the Allies. Chanel traveled to the Reich Main Security Office located in Berlin, Germany in 1943, along with her previously mentioned German lover, Baron Dinklage. Chanel and Dinklage reported to Walter Schellenberg at Reich Main Security Office to discuss Chanel's secret plan. Coco Chanel stated she wanted to meet Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, to persuade him to reach a compromise with the Germans. Massive effort took place to achieve this mission, but it proved to be a failure for the Nazi party. The plan collapsed after the recruit Vera Beta Lombardi denounced Chanel and others to the British embassy as Nazi spies. With her plan down the drain, she faced interrogation by the Free French Purge Committee in September 1944. The committee was unable to find evidence, thus releasing the criminal mastermind. A witness statement by Chanel's grandniece states, Chanel said, Churchill had me freed when returning home from the committee. Historians debate whether Churchill intervened when Chanel became a Nazi suspect, but no definitive answer can be given. After the war, Coco Chanel moved to Switzerland once more, where she lived for years. Her business remained closed for 15 years since its closing in 1939. When Chanel was over 70 years old during the 1950s, she decided to reopen her couture house. Re-entering the fashion world in 1954, Chanel made a fantastic comeback. Like her previous style of working up, she slowly gained fame from surrounding areas and eventually the United States. Chanel's designs were featured in many press releases and eventually the US Vogue. During the 1950s, the United States began to fall in love with her unique designs and Chanel's brand flooded the US market. Chanel lived her last years lonely and tyrannical. She was 87 years old when she died on January 10th, 1971 at Hotel Ritz. Her cause of death is unknown, but likely due to her frail age. Her last words reported by her maid were, you see, this is how you die. Even in her last breaths, Coco Chanel's ego never altered. The company to this day has been highly successful, ranking in millions and millions of dollars every single year. Many would die to have an iconic Chanel handbag nowadays, but what if they really knew the truth? 
The company continually tries to hide its dark past while others remain blissfully unaware as they spend thousands of dollars on Chanel Couture. The fact that companies can try their hardest to protect information so smoothly, it scares me a little bit. It just comes to show that we need to question everything in society because in reality, our role models could easily be a Coco Chanel in disguise. And so that is where we are going to end this quick and quaint dive into the history of Chanel and of course their iconic leader, Coco Chanel. So if you've made it this far into the video, congratulations on making it towards the end. And what did you think was the most interesting thing you've learned about Chanel today? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you guys enjoyed today's video, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more content just like this if you're not already subscribed. And if you pop open the description box, you're going to find links to all of my social media, Twitch, second channel, Discord, and more. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye guys.